Hi, Jason Odegaard, licensed marriage and family therapist, coming back to you um, from OKC Kids Urology. Um, just wanted to speak to you a little bit more from a personal perspective, but also from a psychological therapeutic perspective uh, about the complications involved in having a child with extrophy, whether it's cloacal or bladder. Um, if you've had a child with bladder extrophy, cloacal extrophy for more than just a handful of months, you know that there's a lot of research out there and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, surgeries and, and procedures that have to happen in order to get your kiddo healthy and happy. Uh, but aside from that, you also know that there's a lot of complications and concerns that can arise at any given time. More minor things like UTIs, uh, those types of infections, uh, reflux, things of that nature, all the way to bigger stuff like bladder stones, uh, you know, wounds that don't heal properly, uh, issues with catheterization, um, constipation, you know, things of that nature. So there's obviously a large myriad of things that can happen, which will undoubtedly cause stress on yourself as the parent, as well as in your relationship. Um, so the first thing I can address or want to address would be, it's important to be able to expect that you will likely have some sort of complication. I think oftentimes we get upset at the idea of what is unknown or unpredictable. Okay, so if we have an expectation that our life is gonna be great and there are gonna be no issues, inevitably we're gonna be disappointed. Okay, so uh, sometimes we have to mourn the loss of the fact that we don't have a healthy child who may or may not grow up to be happy and healthy at all times. Um, and I know that can be devastating, especially those of you that your extra free child might be your third child or your fourth child where, you know, the children that came before were extra healthy and extra athletic and strong academically and all those kinds of things. So to have a child that doesn't meet that expectation can be devastating. And again, part of the grieving process might mean that you need to seek out some psychotherapy uh, to help you manage that, to help you manage your expectations, as well as to be able to fully and completely love your child in the way that you can and need to, as well as um, just to treat them just like every other child, even though technically they might not quite meet your original expectations. Um, communication with your spouse, I think, is incredibly important as well. Uh, like I said, there can be a, a huge grieving process, and it's not, a, it's not um, healthy to go about that grief alone. You know, the best thing you guys can do is to support each other in the way that you need to be supported. And the best way to provide that is to ask questions. You know, I know that if I ask my wife how she's doing, what she needs, she's far more likely to tell me what she needs and then I can better meet that need instead of just assuming that I know what she needs. So there's a concept called the five love languages that maybe you've heard of, you know, um, quality time, acts of service, um, words of affirmation, uh, gift giving, and physical touch. Um, so think about that right now. What is your love language? Think about your love language when it comes to high stress. You know, your husband might bring you home a dozen red roses uh, as a gesture thinking, I know you've been under a lot of pressure lately. You've been up in the middle of the night, every night with the kiddo for the last week. And I thought I would do something nice. Well, guess what? Your love language might not be gift giving or gift receiving you really just wanted a hug and you really wanted to sit down and watch your favorite netflix show together so even though he has good intention it's poorly received so again high communication is incredibly important to help manage stress to be on the same page to know what your needs are to know what your spouse's needs are because then we can better meet them we don't want to do what we call mind reading which is assuming we know what the other person needs based usually on the past or based on what we know we would want for ourselves. You know, I can't impose upon my wife to say, you definitely want a night out at the sports bar being able to watch your favorite sport. Um, Cause that would be ridiculous in her mind. She would never want to do such a thing. Um, again, the more you guys can connect with each other and talk about what your wants and needs are is valuable. Another thing people tend to do when they're dealing with um, unexpected complications um, they just go into crisis mode. Crisis mode is somewhat like fight or flight. It's not quite adrenaline oriented, but it can be at times and it feels very close. 
Couples tend to actually get along better when they're in fight or flight mode because they become focused solely on getting the job done, making sure that the crisis or the fire is put out, so to speak. Uh, and like I said, this often makes couples get along better um, because they're not caught up in the minutia of not getting their needs met. Their focus is solely on the child, um, which for the time being can actually be a positive thing. It can reinforce, hey, we're doing well together. We work well together. I can ask you to do something and I can rely on you to follow through on it. You're not going to forget. You're not going to miss it. Um, I will say this. There is a need after the crisis to debrief. Oftentimes we forget about our spouse in those moments and there's usually nothing intentional about it, but we try to return back to normal homeostasis and we don't ever bother to check in with our partner. Uh, so I'd encourage you to check in with each other after things are calm and say, what was that like for you? Uh, what could we do better next time? What more do you need from me? Again, building a culture of uh, questioning so that we can not make any sort of assumptions and we can get proper feedback from our spouse that is authentic, it's real, and it feels safe. Where, you know, I might say, you know what, you really weren't there for me when I needed you. Um, but I appreciate you asking because I want to give you some feedback of how you how I need you in the future. And it can be done with a with a calm demeanor in a place where I can just say, here's what I really want to need from you. Okay, so it's important to plant those seeds for the next time because like I said, with extrophy, as you already know, it's not predictable. So it's inevitable to expect that something will happen at some point. God forbid, I hope everything is smooth for everybody. Um, but in the event that it's not, remember communication needs to go up. We need to be able to be checked in, even if it's a two or three minute check in every day, just say, hey, how are things? What do you need? How are you doing? And move on. Does that make sense? So make sure that you're working together, make sure you're on the same page. And if you need to over communicate, I'd recommend that. The good news is there is such a thing as having a stress reducing conversation, which is very simple. If one of you brings a complaint of stress, whether it be work stress or stress about an upcoming surgery for one of your kiddos or post-surgery fear of, you know, they're not sleeping well or they might have an infection, UTI, whatever it may be, um, it's important to have those connections. And, and scientifically, you really only need to connect with each other for about five minutes a day on those stressors not in general, but just on those stressors to talk about what's going on. So kind of the how was your day type of idea, um, but specific to this kind of thing. So that way I can vent to my partner. I can say, this is what's going on. This is what I'm worried about. This is how I feel. And this is what I want or need from you. Then I would love my partner to give me that feedback. You know, I, I find it also incredibly valuable to assign a role to the other partner. Oftentimes, couples will approach each other, one will approach the other person and say, I'm, you know, just start venting about work stress or child stress, whatever it may be. And the other person will jump in with advice or the other person won't say anything and they might just say, that sounds really hard. Okay, but you as the speaker, you who are talking, it would benefit you to give the other person a job. So, for example, I might say, I have this stress, I have this concern, I need your advice. Or I might say, I had this really bad day at work, I just need you to listen. I just need you to give me empathy. Okay, so that will also mitigate a potential argument because you might say, you might have the intention of I need to vent, then your spouse starts giving you advice and you don't want the advice. So again, that will kind of put that matter to rest ahead of time. Um, so pay attention to each other's uh, demeanor, to their body language, and then also, like I said, in times of crisis, it's good to over communicate. That way you guys can definitely be sure you're on the same page. You can better meet each other's needs and you can get through the crisis together.